Buckle up, sports fanatics. This is the Sports Chasers Podcast, your HQ for in-depth sports talk. Join host Kevin L. Warren and crew as they dissect the hottest stories, ignite debates, and bring you closer to the action. From locker room whispers to expert takes, we cover it all. It's game time. So strap in and grab a drink. The Sports Chasers Podcast starts right now. Hey, what's going on, everybody? What's happening, everybody? Hope everybody's having a fantastic week. By the time you see this, should be up by Tuesday or Wednesday. Should be up by tomorrow, though, Tuesday. But, hey, it's another edition of the Sports Chasers Podcast, and we're tapping back into this vein of the um, sports medicine, so to speak. Uh, We have a special guest. We have another special guest for you tonight. Um, But before we meet our special guest, let's meet the crew. We got the DA. DA, what's going on, brother? How are you tonight? Oh, man, we're here, you know. Making the dollar out of 15 cent. <laughs> <laughs> the American dream here. Dusty Rhodes. With with one of your 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 beloved canines in the back. I that's hear. your boy, that's your boy Otis. That's Otis. <laughs> tonight we got a special treat to you tonight. Uh we're gonna be talking about sports vision, which is important, right? You need to see. And um we uh met this gentleman. Uh, uh let me just read his bio real quick. Um before I introduce him, his name is Dr. Daniel Moses Labby. Dr. Daniel Labby is a board certified ophthalmologist. He is currently an associate clinical professor at the State University of New York College of Ophthalmology and a former assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Labby has served as staff at ophthalmologist for several professional sports teams, including the New York Mets, Boston Celtics, and the LA Kings. He has also been featured on numerous TV stations, including Fox and CBS News, as well as numerous newspapers. Dr. Labby has been trained in ophthalmology and specialized in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. I hope I'm saying that was right, as well as sports vision. Uh, without further ado, hey, let's meet Dr. Daniel Labby. Let me give him some applause here, man. <laughs> He deserves that to work with the Mets now. So, yeah, give him all the applause you can give him. <laughs> Doctor, how are you tonight, man? How are you? How's, how's things going? I'm good, thanks. Thanks. Glad to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Man, this is um, – I'm glad you – so, give you a little backstory. We uh, met Dr. Doc, the doc here on Pod Match, um, and um, we, we connected together. We had an um, informal discussion before beforehand and um I, I think this is a great topic man we actually had a sports um hypnotist um here two weeks like two weeks in a row we talked to mr jason metlock man so i thought this was a great segue to you with more sports medicine so to speak and um you know how did you let me so let me just set it off here how did you before you started working with the teams what made you want to be a ophthalmologist <laughs> as we all wearing glasses <laughs> That's an inter- interesting story you know the uh, basically I, I thought you know i was pretty naive as a young kid and i finished uh you know college and i was like well i can go to med school and i can learn everything about medicine and i got to yeah. med school and i realized quickly i'm not going to be able to learn everything about medicine so you have to narrow it down some so then we narrowed it down to ophthalmology and i can learn everything about the eye well i quickly learned i'm not going to be able to learn everything about the eye i kept narrowing it down narrowing it down until we got to what i'm doing right now Hey, gotcha. focus, 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 Things yeah, come into focus. No pun intended, right? <laughs> All right, so when you narrowed it down, what made you think, like, hey, this is it? What What was that aha moment for you? Well, the sports part actually was totally by accident. Um, I had no, you know, I, I played some sports in, in, in high school. I, you know, I tell the story that I was I was on the varsity golf team in, in, uh, in high school, but the only reason I was on the varsity golf team is because they needed six people and I was number six. <laughs> uh, so, and there was nobody else. So it was not very hard to make that team. Um, but it was totally by accident. I, I'm, I'm interested in sports, but not nothing. I was thinking, not thinking about it as a career. And then I got to do my training at UCLA, the very last year of my training at UCLA. And the guy, the director came to me and said, we've got this project that I need you to finish. And I'm like, I don't want to finish. I want my own project. I'm going to start it from myself, I want my own ideas. He's like, no, I need you to finish this. So we kind of negotiated a little bit, and I took over this project, and it happened to be the results of work they had done with the L.A. Dodgers a few months previous to my arrival. And I took it over and kind of evaluated everything, did the statistics on it, and wrote papers about it. And uh, 
that sort of started the process. The Dodgers had me back every year, every year after that for many years, uh, about 18. And then uh, when I got to Boston uh, in 1990, 1999, I arrived in Boston. And then about 2003, I think, 2002, 2003, Red Sox kind of heard about me. And uh, Theo Epstein brought me in to work with the Red Sox in uh, oh. the winter of 2003, just before 2004. Other teams heard about it, and it kind of blossomed from that. But I worked with probably at least uh, probably a third to a half of all the MLB teams, probably 10 to 15 uh, MLB teams over the years. Got to. Go ahead, D. I'm sorry, it's me. So what what did you do with the Dodgers? Like what exactly was, you know, what, what did you help them with? What was your yeah. uh, expected outcome uh, from what you were, you know, what you got into with them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because at that point in the early 90s, no one really knew anything about sports vision. No one had done anything in that area. The Dodgers were kind of groundbreaking in that. In that, And we started out doing a whole bunch of different tests, like every kind of test you can think of, trying to figure out what's important for an athlete to perform, a batter to hit the baseball. And what we found was that a lot of what we did was worthless. For example, color vision. Color vision is not important to hitting wow. a baseball. Uh, so we stopped doing that test. And we kind of whittled it down to the key the key important test. So the Dodgers were kind of our training ground, our learning spot. We go uh, year after year, we could see these guys, major leaguers, minor leaguer guys, uh, rookie of the year guys, you know, Mike Piazza, for example, you know, from when he was signed all the way through, you know, his major league, major league time, the time of the sort of, and all that, all that experience got a kind of got us into the mindset of what we have to do in baseball to be, you know, to be productive and to help the batters perform better. Um, so without the work we did the Dodgers, I don't, I guarantee I wouldn't be where I am now. That really was the basis, and from that, sports vision really grew quite a bit. Makes yeah. sense. I have uh, he said he color has nothing to do with it. That was that's that was that's mind blowing. Um, and as, yeah. as we go later on in the, into the conversation, I'll you know I'll I'll give you um, what a Dominican a guy told me. When my son played up at two hundred thirty first Street, um, yeah. um, and and the little league. He said he had a piece of tape he would put on a ceiling fan uh-huh. and have his son, you know, at night. And he, I'm not, when I say son, I mean, like, our kids are five, six years old. Okay. Follow the red ribbon as it went around the, you know. Um, the fan. The, yeah, the ceiling fan. So he could pick up, the, the, you know, just being able to pick up the laces on the baseball. So he knew, he said, by the time he gets to be 15 or 16, he'll be able to know what type of pitch is coming based upon, you know, what he sees with the, you know, the revolutions of the book, you know, different pitches are going to look differently coming in. So I was like, okay, that's the first time I, in my life I've ever heard of anything like that. You know, and then, you know, later on, I, you know, sports uh, ESPN, I saw some things about Larry Fitzgerald and things that you, you know, uh, uh, guys of your ilk <laughs> kind of had him go through. So, um, but yeah, I'll shut up now, but that's very interesting to me. Well, he, he was he was definitely not to something. So it's not so much the ability to see color vision. What he's training there is the ability to pick up information, you know, quickly, right? Uh, and that that's without a doubt important. In fact, we moved from when we test vision, we don't use a regular eye chart because um, the eye chart isn't at all what's like to hit a baseball. If you think about the eye chart, you can stare at the eye chart for you know for five minutes and give an answer. It's black on white. It's it's really not not similar to baseball. Baseball, you have a quick second to view this very small target. That's very faint, and so what we did is create a test that has that has small targets that are faint and only show for a short time, and we found actually that that test correlates to batting metrics, uh, plate discipline metrics, whereas the regular eye chart doesn't correlate, doesn't connect mm. because it's too dissimilar. And what he's doing with the quick look at the red tape is a similar type of test. Got you. Um, very intriguing. Let me let me ask you this, Doc. Um, well, we started already talking about some of the sciences behind it. Um, how does it impact athletes of all levels in the incredible and, you know, share some of the um, stories about, you know, the science of sports visions? Because, you know, people think, uh, you know, and it also just want to point out maybe I'm um, just um, you're working with the Celtics and you working with Major League Baseball teams and. Tell me how that was a little bit different before you go to my first question that I asked. I know I was asking you about, but how would that be different? Well, you sport, you know, not only that, not only the NBA, I've worked with three different NBA teams, and so not only NBA uh, versus MLB, but 
we I worked with the U.S. Olympic team in Beijing and a whole bunch of different sports uh, on the U.S. team. Uh, we had a team in Tokyo last summer as well, the baseball team in Tokyo that played in the tournament there. Um, I did the L.A. Kings uh, hockey hockey team. Right. Uh, Wayne Gretzky was on that team uh, that year. I tested them. A bunch of other guys, good. Um, I worked with a Premier League player in the, in the U.K., um, Liverpool Football Club, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold. So I've kind of gotten a, a good appreciation of different sports and different um, different visual needs. I, you know, I, F1, I have an F1 driver that I've worked with. Um, all sorts of different people. And the important thing to understand is that each sport has a different kind of visual package. Right. Um, they all need the eyes. No, no, one, no one performs sport well with their eyes closed. Uh, you have to have your eyes open. And so that information is important, but different information is different for each sport. You know, peripheral vision is important for basketball, soccer, or football, right? But peripheral vision for baseball batting has no role. You're looking straight ahead at the ball and the pitcher. And so there's a big difference right there already, right? We look at sports that have small balls and move quickly, like tennis, hockey, baseball, lacrosse, versus balls that are much larger and shorter distances that move slower, basketball, Intense. right? And those are all different visual needs. And so the important thing is to kind of have an understanding of what, just like, a, you know, you go to the doctor, you have a cough and you have a stomach ache, you better get different treatment. If you get the same treatment for a cough and a stomach ache, you need a different oh, doctor. doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So same thing with sports. If you come in and the sports doctor tells you everyone's got to train like this, they're missing something, right? You have to right. look at the sport the athlete's playing, evaluate them, see where there's a problem, and address that problem to fix it. Just like if you come in with a with a you know cough or a stomach ache. What were some of the what were some of the similar things that some of the anybody any sport will come to you with? Well, everybody needs you know decent vision, right? Right. Whether it's 2020 or 2012, um, you know, there's a big difference there. But no one can really perform sport good with, you know, 2040 or 2050 vision. You need to have you need to have at least pretty good vision for all sports, right? Unless you have uh, those rec specs that I used to wear. So, you know, back in the <laughs> 80s. Man, D, I was. <laughs> hey, man, listen, man. I'm blind. That I, I'm the one with the Coke bottles. So <laughs> I, I will let you know. But they, they did accommodate Coke bottles with the Rex Specs and they fit yeah. under your helmet. So there you go. They still have Rex Specs and they're they're good because they have no strap around. You know, they have a strap instead yeah. of a temple part here. Remember so that? Just, How big the strap was? The, the actual, yeah, man. <laughs> I, I, Doc, I'm going to get to your question, but yeah, these taking me down memory lane when I was playing high school. Shout out to Lafayette High School, you know, in Brooklyn. Um, what's the guy, the third baseman that used to play for the Reds? I wanted to be like him because he was a third baseman, right. um, and he wore those rec specs. His name was Chris. I can't think of his name. It'll come to me. But I, I, I remember my mother in these 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 other glasses that I couldn't wear like these. He's like, my goodness, these things insurance don't even cover it. And <laughs> at the time, and um, well, you know, but players sometimes leverage that. For example, we gave Eric Gagne from the Dodgers a picture. Yeah. The picture we gave him. Um, hmm. Glasses, and that became his kind of trademark. He was yes. not his kind of his thing. He was wild thing from a uh, major leagues. <laughs> yep. Yep. But that's so, you know, though. He oh, yeah. threw he he threw straight heat, man. He was serious business, man. At least the years that he pitched. Too, though, but huh? I think he was involved in the steroid thing a little bit. Yeah, yes, yeah. Well, you know, hey, listen, Daniel, we could talk about that off air. I got my own feelings on that because my favorite player of all time is Barry Lamar Bond. So, mm. Yeah, so I'm sorry. But yeah, that, that's very interesting. So, how did you transition that to, to kids, and and how how would a parent get their son or daughter uh, in front of you, and and why would they do yeah. that? You know, so so kids and sports are actually very similar because kids need to have good vision to develop to develop normally to develop use of their eyes normally, and I think that's why when this project started at UCLA. It was the pediatric ophthalmology section that was doing the project because that matched more closely to what the Dodgers needed. You know, good visual function. Different than if it, none, none of the, you know, the Dodgers, the players don't have cataracts, they don't have glaucoma, they don't have retinal attachments. You know, those are all the other other areas in the in the in the department. But the pediatric, the kids, you know, we're trying to get them to just see normally so they can develop normally and and have good depth perception and so forth. And so there's a lot of synergy between what the, base, the baseball players needed and the kids need. So that's kind of how that kind of came together. But, you know, if, you, if you're a kid, if you're a parent of a kid, 
and your child is serious about sports and you're driving them out, you know, a couple, uh, every day of the weekend somewhere and maybe some travel, travel stuff. Um, it makes sense for you if you want them to do well to maximize their vision to make sure they have that extra edge. Now, it's not going to be the same as what you're going to do for a, a major league ball player, for example, because uh, there's other factors that are going to influence performance at that age besides vision. But there's no question that if the child's not seeing properly and they're not reacting fast enough, they're not going to be able to kind of be the top of their group. And if they want to progress uh, in high school and college and so forth, you got to be near the top of your group. Gotcha. Very interesting. I already, I found out who, who this person was. Um, let me get it right here. Chris Sable, if you remember correctly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Sable. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there they are. Yeah. yeah. So there they go. Look at those things, man. You couldn't so see up the side for anything. You had no <laughs> peripheral. <laughs> no money. Right? Yeah. 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 You, you literally had to keep your head on the swivel. Literally. Well, like you had to be turning your head because you, you would get ear hold all the time. You know, because you could now never see wear, it coming. Yeah. People wear the the uh, the uh, wrap the bubble the wrap ones wrap. now. Yeah, yeah. Now they wear the bubble ones. Yeah, or they get contacts. But I had a, a stigmatism. So I right. a, 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 back in the days, you couldn't get the contacts were hard contacts. Yeah, and they only came round. You couldn't get them if you had a stigmatism. So, and you know, yeah. My mother will tell you a story one day, Kev. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry. I, actually, I, I, I acted a fool on Fordham Road when they put it in my eye. And I was like, yeah, oh, it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> you know, that was, that's going way back. But yeah, well, that, it that's so interesting. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It takes like three, four weeks to get used to the hard lens. Yeah. 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 But wow. So, so what's the, okay? So if a, you know, a 10 year old or 12 year old comes in, you know, kind of a phenom, a young Bryce Harper. We'll just yep. say, and their dad or mom wants you to take a look at them. What what are you what are you looking at exactly? What are you what are you trying to do with them? Yep. So we 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 had developed something we call the sports vision pyramid. And if you think about a pyramid, I think that's a pretty good pyramid. Uh, pyramids are very stable. So you want to work at the base and make sure you have a good solid base, and then work on each layer as you go up towards the top of the pyramid. And if you do that, then you're going to have a good performance. Uh, it doesn't make sense, for example, to work on someone to be reacting really fast if they can't see what to react to, for example. So the bottom of the pyramid is your vision with each eye, how sharp your vision is. And so the first thing we would do is check the vision, check to see if there's a little prescription, glasses, contacts, something that we can use to get the vision optimal. And remember, 2020 vision is just average. 2020 is not enough if you want to hit a, a fastball and, you know, MLB fastball. It's not enough if you want to react fast enough to a, to a tennis serve. You need better vision than that. And so we want to maximize everyone's ability to see. And often it's better than 2020 if you have a little bit of a prescription that needs corrected. The next thing we look at is how the two eyes work together, and that's 3D depth perception. You can imagine if you're a boxer, you better have good depth perception. If you're a boxer, you're going to have you know a right hook to the face. Yeah. The jaw you can know about. Uh, so depth perception is important. Fencing, if you're a fencer, depth perception is important. Other sports, though, like archery, for example, depth perception is really not important because the target is flat and it's far away. And so in archery, vision is important and sharpness, but depth perception isn't, isn't that important. But we, that's the second level is, is using both eyes together. Then we want to see how you make decisions based on what you see. Because, you know, whether it's a go or no-go decision, that's going to tell you if you're going to make an action or not based on, you know, you're going to swing the bat or not. Uh, you're going to return the serve or not. Are you projecting it's going to fall outside the lines and, you know, you're not going to return it. It's an out. All those things. So that's a matter of decision making. So we look at some decision making metrics. Then we go up from that and look at hand eye coordination, reaction time, how vision can guide a motor action to accomplish a task in the sport. You know, whether it's swinging the bat, whether it's swinging the racket, whether it's kicking a ball to the goal if you're playing soccer, you know, catching a, a pass from your, your quarterback, whatever it is. Uh, those are hand eye movements that have to be perfectly timed and perfectly placed for success. And if you do all that properly, you're at the top of the pyramid, which is ideal on-field uh, performance so that's the approach we take okay gotcha so yeah, yeah so i i see it it takes a lot of you know your knack and know-how and also science into this to you know make sure a, a person i guess is performing um you know at the top of the game and, and you know and, and optimal let me ask you this when it comes to any kind of athlete, whether it be young, young or old, what do you do for a person 
who has who comes to you when you when the athlete came to you and they had some kind of problem or, and you know maybe they was wearing glasses and like da said they, what what do you do for what do you do for them do, do you give them a better fit do you tell them do they come to you and say hey i would like this or you just suggest what would what would, what would you do doc well mo most people don't know what they don't know so Right. Most guys come in and don't know what they're missing. They think they're they're fine. But then when we go through the exam and I show them what, you know, the MLB guys do and I show them what they do, they're like, oh, shit, I can't, I can't see that. Right. So we have to then fix their glasses, fix their contacts, change things a little bit, do a little bit, spend a little bit more time with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spend a little bit more time with them to, you know, get it just perfect to get them that optimal vision. And what we found is that these guys, these athletes are much more sensitive to small changes than the average person is. And so it's very important to put the effort in to get these small corrections perfect so they have the best vision. So that, that's pretty much, you know, where we start. Uh, then I put them through the paces. And these are things that most of the guys have never done before. They've never seen it before. They may have heard about it, maybe, but they've never like, been tested and evaluated. And they certainly never trained. So those are all the things we want to. Well, Daniel, know. real quick, I'm going to email all my high school coach and tell him exactly why I could never hit the fastball because all I could get to with the Coke bottles was 2020 vision. See? Ha! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you can put my name on that too. That's uh, The problem is you weren't able to predict. See, it's all about vision and sports is all about prediction. It's the ability to see something and then predict where the ball is going to be in the future. Because if you can do that, you can put the bat on it or you can put the racket on it, put your foot on it, all those things. You can put it past the goal if you need to, if you can predict what's going to happen in the future. That's what the point of vision is. And so if you don't have sharp enough vision, then you don't see the spin. If you don't see the spin, you don't know where the ball's going to come and you can't predict it. And that's a major problem. That's why I had the Rock Carew stance uh, as big as I was because I needed to keep the bat in the zone. And, yep. And then I just try to, you know, muscle it through because I couldn't do like Kev and hold the bat up top because yeah. the time I got through the, the, the zone, the catcher had the ball and be going home. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I know. I got a letter to write. That's where yeah. I do. <laughs> but, but that's unfortunate. We, we, have, we don't see too many, you know, too many players with high prescriptions. There are a couple of pitchers, but not too many batters with high prescriptions. Makes sense. Um. Talk about hand-eye coordination, especially yep. with baseball. And I, we'll, we probably touched on a little bit. What's your thoughts on that science of hitting the baseball that's coming at you, like DA said, 90 miles? Well, now the pitchers pitch like hundreds of miles an hour, and, and they change up is 92 miles an hour. Give us a little your insight on what the, the athlete, you know, is, is thinking during that process. Well, if you think about how long it takes a 90 mile an hour, 90 mile an hour, so that's a slow pitch, a 90 mile an hour fastball to get from the hand to the glove, right? That's about four tenths of a second, we'll say. It takes about 150 milliseconds. So there's 400 milliseconds. It takes 150 milliseconds to swing the bat. That leaves a quarter of a second, 250 milliseconds to actually see the pitch, decide what it is, decide if you're going to swing and start the actual process of swinging. A quarter of a second. Just to let you know a blink is a third of a second. So it's less time than a blink of an eye to you have to start your swing if you're going to have a chance to hit the ball. And the ball, remember, is going to be probably 50 feet away at that point. It's going to be far away. So the, it's not easy to see it. And you got to do this subconsciously. You got to do it kind of automatic. You can't, like, think about it. Like, this is a fastball. It's going to come here. I'm going to put the bat over here. You don't have time for that. It has to be chop, chop, automatic. And so that whole process is incredibly difficult. Then if you get a Rob Chapman who throws 105, whatever, 106 miles per hour, <laughs> Now, you don't even have a quarter second anymore because you're swinging fast, so you, that's not going to change. Your quarter second becomes, you know, two tenths or maybe 150 milliseconds. You know, it's, it gets to be ridiculously short, and that's why. That Jesuit basket, what for? I swear I am. He's going to get it. <laughs> there was no way I could hit the ball, Kevin. No way. <laughs> no. It, 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 everything was stacked against you for sure. Sorry, bro. I, I you had to get that bat. That bat, you know, a little bit faster. I had trouble with the curveball. That was my thing. No, I'm I, I, listen. I had trouble with the curveball. I well, you know, I would thought sometimes, and I mean, maybe that's why I didn't go to the next level. But yeah, I had trouble with the curveball. I can see it, but I swear it felt like it was about to hit me all the time. And I always bailing out. So that was my story with the curveball. 
<laughs> See, but this is so freaking fascinating, man. Oh my god, I yeah. swear you write this old bastard a letter. I don't even know if he's still alive. He's getting his old wife. Okay, he better not have a wife. He's judging what he's supposed to have. A <laughs> brother, Shit, god. Doc, what would you do for hockey players? Um, what well, would you do for them? Yeah, not too different than baseball. You know, we have a small target moving, you know, pretty fast. Um, you know, it's not it's not in the air, it's on the ice in general. Um, but there's the same kind of um, you don't have to, you don't have to read the the spin of the puck so much, but you have to be able to see the blade hitting the puck, the angle is hitting the puck. You know what kind of movement is on that on that puck when it's being contacted. That's all critical, and you got to do it really quick because it's moving fast. And you don't have a lot of time. You know I don't know how these goalkeepers are actually you know not going crazy because having a puck shot at you at the speeds are shot at and having to react to it is not easy. I saw, uh, of course, being from the city, I'm, I'm a Rangers fan and I was watching them against the Islanders. Yes. What was that Sunday or Saturday? DA was Saturday boy. Great. Game. And, 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 and Igor, um, um, Stokin, he made a, like you said, um, it was a one timer from one of the Islanders and the way that he made this butterfly slave save was incredible. And like you said, the, puck is coming at you probably more than 100 plus miles an hour and how he got it well that's why he's a professional athlete did you work with goalies more or no it was the whole the whole team we worked with but the okay key, the key to the key to a goalkeeper is something called the quiet eye uh it's looking at what point what's critical what's critical to try to stop that shot what was critical is to look at the the um, hockey hockey stick on the puck and the moment before it moves, when it moves, and the moment after, what he's looking at. And if he's not looking around, if he's fixed right on that co- point of contact between the, the, the blade of the stick and the puck, he's going to have a better chance of identifying where it's going to go and stopping it. If he's moving around, looking at the shooter, looking at other players, trying to understand who's nearby him, it's going to be a going to be a goal. Which is and- why they try to have somebody standing in front of the goalie to block his to block that point. Too. Right. And that's why they want you down there, you know, to get your big butt in front of the goalie so he doesn't see it coming. Yep. Screen them. Yeah. Nah, that's that's definitely um <laughs> like DA said, this is definitely a fascinating um subject. And um kudos, you know, I'm glad you you reached out to me and we was able to connect and do this because I think this is <laughs> definitely important and I want you know our listeners to know that yo, it's just not about the sports itself, but some of the behind the scenes and what makes them great. What makes them great, and you gotta be able to see. It, it sounds simple enough, but man, there's a reason why me and Da is talking on the mic right now. We're uh, not, not 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 rich I'm, somewhere from playing. So, <laughs> you see my glasses too. I'm 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 yeah. sitting on the mic also here, right? So, so concussions, um, concussions. What 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 is their impact on? And I'll, I'll just go to a professional athlete, right? That that's you know whether football, uh, baseball, uh, anywhere that's a professional so you you know he's at the level where his his ocular you know from what he does he's uh he can hit you know he has it all he gets a concussion um does that make him have to start over again at a certain point or how does that impact you know what you do and what you train for train athletes for yeah well it depends you know concussion is very general so there there can be a lot of a lot of different parts of the brain that get injured um but in general, you know, you're taking your concussions when you take your brain and you slam it against the wall and you slam it back against the other wall and you hope it's okay. Um, basically, a bunch of wires like spaghetti that's nicely arranged gets all messed up, you know, it gets all tangled up. And then it's got to get re- rearranged. Well, if you get rearranged perfectly, and that usually happens after maybe the first concussion, but every time you have another concussion, it doesn't quite get back to the way it was. And it's going to be often can be subtle that, you know, people have headaches and all sorts of more obvious things. But People often feel like they've recovered, but they have subtle deficits because those neurons aren't connected the way they used to be. They've been torn up and they've been tried to reestablish themselves, but it's not the same as it was originally. And that can have a subtle impact on performance. Now, it may not make a big, big difference, you know, at the high school level, but at a professional level where these, you know, its ability to perform is so finely different between one guy and the next that you want to have that little bit of advantage. If you've lost that because you've had too many concussions, you're going to lose your performance. And so concussions are, are, you know, unfortunately a reality of sport, especially yeah. aggressive sport. Um, but it's something that 
if you have too many of them, can not only affect your sport performance, but it can affect your rest of your life, which is unfortunate. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And, and never, just, never you know, I've seen guys uh, stonewalling. You know, they do, they, they, the first, beginning of the year, they do on purpose badly on the concussion test. So then when they get a concussion, you know, they get compared the results. And they see it's no different. So they say they're okay. They go back to play. Uh, uh, but so they, on purpose, you know, bomb the first the first baseline test. Um, that's only hurting themselves, right? That's only making them uh, be damaged for life. And there really isn't any reason that you want to chop your finger off for no reason at all. That's not, not the way to go. Gotcha. Understood. Understood. So, um, so how long exactly has, you know, ophthalmology has been around for a long time, um, but the focus on athletics and sport, how long has that been around? Not, not, not too long. In fact, you know, you go back when I started there 31 years ago, it was very, very early. You go back maybe 20 years before that, and it really didn't exist. Um, the other thing is it started out being very, you know, hearsay and very non-scientific. And as the years have passed, it's gotten a lot more scientific, fortunately. Um, so that, that you know, it's a very young field, and it's a field that's uh, still developing quite a bit. And I think we have a lot to learn, a lot to understand still in, in vision and sports and how not just the eyes, but the brain's use of the eyes and the motor actions based on the eyes, how that all ties together and how it works. So I think it's uh, it's very early is the bottom line. Gotcha. Doc, let's talk about your book, Eye of the Champion. What inspires you to do this, this to write this book? And what's some of the, um, I was just reading through it, some of the stuff today. Um, what are some of the nuggets that you can excerpt from the book um, that you may want our, want our listeners to, to know? Yeah. You know, so after 30, 31 years of doing this, it gets you get to the point where, you know, you're going to retire at some point and you want to leave something that's going to be useful for the next group of doctors, the next athletes that are coming up that can have an idea of what I've learned in 30 years. So I have to restart, reinvent the wheel. You know, people can pick up where, I, where I'm at. And so I wanted to put together kind of my 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 knowledge, my information kind of in one kind of short, short volume that would be easy to understand. Um, and we just put this out. This is brand new. We just put it out in March. Um, I wrote it over the last summer and over last last fall. Uh, it's in paperback. It's a hardcover. It's an ebook, and just on Audible and a bunch of other platforms. The audiobook came out uh, last week, so it's kind of wh wh however you like to get information, it's out there. Um, and what I've done is I put together based on that sports vision pyramid, based on the prediction, each of the different sections of what how we test it, why we test it, the science behind how we test it, the papers that you know show that this is valid science and valid approaches to things. Uh, all the way through from the bottom of the pyramid all the way up to the top of the pyramid. And I think uh, it's a, it's written not for doctors, it's written for athletes, written for parents of athletes. Um, it has some kind of stories, anecdotes of players that I've worked with, like Matt Ramirez, um, you know, with uh, Tom Lasorda's pictures in there. Um, Stephen Drew, if you remember him, uh, mm -hmm. with him, a bunch of, bunch of people I've worked with. Um, so I tried to get a little bit of a kind of background, personal information in there with a lot of science. And a lot of stuff that hopefully be helpful for anyone who's looking to optimize their vision to perform better at the sport they love. Wow, incredible! D, you had so, a question? Yeah. So, if, if you're in North Carolina, Daniel, is, are, are is there a network? Is, is like are there, is like a a, uh, a list of reputable uh, doctors that would be able to help someone that 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 in that has that sports specialty. Not just you know the ophthalmology um, profession, you yeah. know, because you can go to one, which of course they know what they're doing and they do their job, um, but that may you know work with the sports side of it and may be able to help along the lines of what you know we talked about earlier, why they would come see you, what they were looking for, uh, so forth and so on. I, like with my son, he he just you know it was just through a regular eye exam. They're like, oh wow, your your retina. One more hit, you know, it's going to detach. Yeah. So um, not someone that's actually going there to be trained up for something else. How would they get in touch with someone that is uh, doing in the, in the same field you are and along those lines of, of sports performance? Yeah, you know, North Carolina, you're lucky because you have Duke down there and Duke has a, has a sports, uh, sports vision program uh, that would be a good place to go. But 
unfortunately, not everybody is a Duke <laughs> or in North Carolina. So the, um, you know, there, there is, there's, by the way, sports vision is kind of shared between ophthalmologists and optometrists. And there is an organization called the International Association of Sports Vision, IASV. Mm. You can find it online that has basically people interested in sports vision are members of that. And I think you can find people in, you know, in your area. Uh, it's not the entire country is unfortunately not, you know, ideally covered. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of people that are members of that. There's different, you know, it's not something you have to like pass a test to become a member. So there's a, quite a range of, of experience and a range of, uh, of uh, let's say academic or scientific scrutiny that the people use. Um, so there's some people, you know, that have been doing it for 30 years, such as I, and there are people that have just, you know, finished training, maybe doing it for a year or two. Uh, so there's a bit of range. So the person, the, the, the athlete has to kind of research a little bit and see what works and, you know, try somebody out and see if they want that or some different. Uh, basically, the, and the reason, you know, the reason I wrote the book also was to empower the athlete to know what to talk about when they go to the eye doctor or the sports vision specialist. So they can go in there and say, but wait a second, what about this? You know, and I want to have this kind of vision because I play this sport. That was one of the reasons for the book. So the athletes and parents of athletes would be knowledgeable when they go to the eye doctor to know what they look for, to know what they ask for, to know what they get done. Makes sense. Makes for a better visit. For sure. Uh, yeah, it definitely. That definitely makes sense. Uh, Doc, uh, one of the excerpts from your book, it said, we realized that the regular eye tests did not accurately reflect what a batter was being asked to do when trying to hit a baseball. I know we touched on this a little bit. Yeah. Why did you highlight that? Yeah, because that, you know, the standard, the standard eye chart is about 150 year old test. And unfortunately, forget about sports. It doesn't really match what anybody needs in their real life to, to live. You know, if you're driven at, at dusk on a road, that you're not familiar with and there's a kind of foggy rainy day and there's signs and you have to try to read the sign it's incredibly difficult to read it but you go to the doctor and you check your vision and it's like oh you're perfect you're 20 20. you don't need anything but doc i couldn't see the the sign well because it was rainy well, that's nice but i need to see the sign because i need to know no return around, right? <laughs> right and so the question is we had the regular eye chart doesn't show that because people that have you know good vision people have not so good vision get the same score on the eye chart it's not it's too it's too easy it's too unlike what you have to do when you're regular in regular life. And when's the last time you were driving a car and you could take as long as you want to decide if you're going to turn or decide if you're going to, you know, see a sign or not. You, you can't. Live, you live in the places we live at. They honking the horn at you. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> or at least you pass. You pass your turn. You miss your turn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know. So so an eye chart that gives you unlimited time to find to read something doesn't seem to make sense if we're looking when we're trying to drive to do something quickly. And so that's why the eye chart really just doesn't just doesn't fit it. You know, even older people go come in with cataracts and they say, Doc, I can't see, I can't read, I can't watch TV. Check your vision in the dark room, you're perfect. No cataract surgery. I'm like, but wait, I can't see. You know, the reason I can't see is because it's not a good enough test, not because the person doesn't have a problem. Understood. And that's why we developed this other test that we talk about in the book that shows targets that are small, faint for a short time, that simulates real world, real life vision that you said well, this why well, I, I might i know the answer to my question now that you say that and like i said i've been wearing glasses pretty much all my life how come this 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 chart doesn't why why won't the powers to be or you know change this chart this 150 year old chart that you know hey cover your eye a e k and me i know i i my vision is awful yeah um, so just just that question that that's a, that's a good question you know science and medicine is very very hard to change um habits and way things are done very hard to change and i don't see that chart going away in <laughs> fact when we made this new test we had to include an equivalent results from the eye chart because wow. people just didn't understand what we're talking about I don't think it's going to change. Uh, I think this we can do is have additional tests that you can do your eye chart test, and let's do the real test after that. Yeah, they tied you to it like an albatross. So, you know. <laughs> well, I go to the DMV. DMV has a chart hanging on the on the on the wall, you know, yeah. and the guy in front of you reads it, and he passes. So all you do is say the same thing he says, and you pass too. Oh, it's a joke. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I got a, a it's a sports but non sports question. 
and I guess I can use it as a sports question because there is uh, shooting art and, and, you know, Olympic sport. But when you shoot, they tell you, you know, you learn things about your dominant eye and all the rest of those things. How does what you do square that whole dominant eye thing as opposed to teaching? Because you did say earlier about, you know, in the pyramid, you know, it's one eye, then two eyes, then, you know, it kind of works up from there. So uh, is that something that you come across with um, within your book? And, and you know, Or is that a, oh, a yeah. crock of shit? Doc is taking out the book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to find where here it is. So I, I, I've written some papers and I have a section in the book about dominant eye. And I don't I don't believe in dominant eye. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why I don't believe in it. And I'll show you some reasons in a moment. But we talk about dominant hands because you either use your right hand or your left hand independently, right? You write with your right hand, you catch with your left hand, whatever you're doing, it's independent. You don't catch with two hands, you don't write with two hands, you don't open doors with two hands, you open doors with one hand, right? But in the eyes, we use both eyes together. That's normal. We want to because both eyes together give us 3D death perception. If you're only using one eye, you're actually ill, you have a problem. So something's not right. Unfortunately, there are the most common tests that people use to check for a dominant eye forces an answer of right or left. There's no, there's no option otherwise. It's either right or left. And that's unfortunate because that test is very ingrained in people, just like the eye chart. And it's hard to get people to change. But if you do another test, and I have a picture of that, of that test here in my book. Let's see if I can get it up here. And that's a pointing test. That's a test where we ask somebody to point their finger at the camera. And if you take a picture of where their finger is, you'll see the guy in the bottom, the finger's right in the middle of the nose, right? And then the other guys on the top, on the top, the, the, the finger's just underneath the, the right eye. And underneath that, it's underneath the left eye. And then the other, I if I get over here, and the other page over here is kind of halfway between the eye and the nose. And so if you have a test that allows you to get a result that's not have to be right or left, that can be somewhere in between, infinite in between, you find that most people are in the middle because they want to use both eyes together. They're not right or left eye dominant. The only reason they are is if you make them choose an eye. But that's not how we walk around, by choosing an eye. We walk around with both eyes. And if you look at different dominance tests, you find out that they go get different results. Well, who's ever heard of a test and another test and different tests that get different results about one thing? The problem is with the test, not so much with the thing, right? And so for that reason, I don't believe that there's a dominant eye. You have a preferred eye if you have to choose. But ideally, you're working with both eyes together. Okay. Yeah, and you know, it makes sense because that's the way I shoot. I don't, you know, you know, I don't cock my body on an angle because I'm using my left eye as the dominant or the right eye as the dominant. It's you know, you see the target and shoot it. But you know, um, with that said, you know, Kevin's a you know, he shoots uh more than me because he's a detective, <laughs> you know, and, and so I I'm sure you know, he has his way of shooting, but I wanted to, I, I Can, the reason I, I use that example is because I don't think a batter is one or the other. He has to keep both eyes open, looking at that darn ball and trying to figure out where it's going to go. And what you said, point something of a second. You know, yeah. I don't think you have time to uh, figure out the dominant eye when looking at, a, uh, you know. Well, I, uh, ideally the head is, the face is turned so both eyes are towards the pitcher. Right? Yeah, should be at least. Should be. So yeah, that's that's very see, I mean, see you guys. Yeah, so that's a whole section of the book. That's an interesting, interesting uh area because we talk about that a lot. Gotta get that, gotta get that book. Uh so since D uh you know said what my vocation is, uh yes, when I started early in my career, I've been doing this for a while. Um I used to shoot the firearm with what is it, my right eye closed. And then so my said I was doing it. They say, "Yo, you right hand or left hand?" I say, "Yo, I'm right hand." They go, "Why you got your your right right eye closed?" I'll never forget it. Mm. I'll never forget it. And they make me switch. Oh wow! <laughs> Closing my <laughs> now I close my left eye. Twenty years later, I mean, I'm still pretty good at it. But I'll never forget that conversation. And and now that you, man, you, I, I didn't get gave you something else. You need to work with a couple of law enforcement folks, man. <laughs> Well, you, you clearly preferred, you know, you closed your right because you preferred your left. That was your choice. When you had to choose, you chose the left. And yeah. in, in shooting, you have a sight, you have a target, you know, that you, mm -hmm. have, you can't do both eyes on that. So you have to choose an eye. Right. But 
I think you're better off using your left if that's your, if that's your preferred eye. Oh uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a done deal now. I done shut the left for the last twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I always shot with both eyes open, so I I, I shot both eyes. Really? In the beginning, so yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I do Rhonda do. We Rhonda does do right. Rhonda does too. So I'm always attention to shot. vision just one eye though, don't you? Huh? You paid attention to the vision in just one eye. I, I don't know. I keep them both open. I keep my body square to the target. So hmm. to me, I'm just looking, you know, at the target. I'm not like closing one or the other, you know. So I'm just, you know, looking at the sights. Front side on the target, pull the trigger. Mm. Bam, that's it. So, it, you know, it seems to work. Uh, mm. But I've seen, you know, people shoot other ways. And I'm not, you know, Daniel or uh, Boone or whatever. So, have at it. You know, as long as you're not shooting at me, have at it. I'm fine with it. So. <laughs> Doc, any funny stories with any of the athletes <laughs> that you, you may share? Well, the funniest, the funniest story, the most embarrassing story, uh, it's in the book too. Um, you know, at, in, the, in the Dodgers, in Dodger Town, was, you know, they had in Vero Beach, Florida, before they moved out to Arizona, they had a whole compound there. It was a really nice compound. It was, it was, a, it was a, it's like a club. It was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and when we saw, we saw the players, but also the, often staff would want to come and get checked too. And one year, Tommy Lasorda wanted to get checked. And so, uh, what happened, we all eating the dining room lunch and there were tables in the dining room and Tommy had his own table and you kind of had to get invited to sit at the Tommy table. Uh, and Tommy came over to our table where we were sitting and was saying, you know, I'm going to get my ass checked, Doc. It's okay. So we went out to the golf cart because Tommy drives around the golf cart. He doesn't walk from one place to the next. And um, he would, um, and he got into the, uh, he got into the passenger seat and I got into the driver's seat, but I was in there a little before him and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but uh, somehow the cart moved and the wheel ran over Tommy's foot. Okay. And, you know, it's not that heavy a golf cart, but I learned a lot of Ita interesting Italian words that that <laughs> uh, afternoon. Uh, and Tommy was all right. Nothing happened to him. And we finally got the eye, eye exam done. But that was one of the, the funniest, uh, the funniest episodes. <laughs> you learned a lot of bad Italian words. <laughs> bad Italian words, yes. God bless Tommy Lasorda. He was a he was a very funny character, uh, as being a major league um, manager for the for the Dodgers and being with the Dodgers organization for pretty much uh, even when I believe they was when he was in Brooklyn. So um, yeah, he played for them in Brooklyn for sure. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this, Doc. Um, before we 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 wind down, um, we I asked you about the funny story. Any What's the new tech, newer technologies that's out that you guys that's in your field that you use now that's cutting edge or or something that's on you know on on the rise that that's you know that makes your diagnosis for you know your clients um, better? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm looking for my picture with Tommy. Uh, let's see if I don't find it. I'll tell you. I'll tell you about the new technology in a moment. You know, you write a book, you forget where everything is in the book. That's the problem. <laughs> too much, too much crap. All right. Well, I promise there's a picture of Tommy the Sword in here with me. I, I, I believe you. We're going to get the book. I can't find it though. Um, <laughs> so, what, what technology-wise is going to be have to do with with these pictures? Um, this is this is a you see a uh, a basketball rim, and you see a bunch of green dots. And in one picture, the dots are all close together. And another picture, the dots are kind of all over the place, right? Right. Okay. So that goes along with the next picture, which over here is a picture with a windup and a circle. And that circle is what the batter was looking at during the windup. And if you look at the picture just when the ball is released, the guy is looking right at the release point, right? You see that in the picture? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So the technology here actually is pretty cool. It's a, uh, a pair of glasses that has a forward-facing camera mm -hmm. that records the view, and it has rear-facing cameras that record where the eyes are pointed. Ooh, wow. And the computer puts it together so that we can see on a picture what someone was looking at when they actually were performing the sport. So wow. the, first picture, the first picture with the, uh, with the basketball, that's actually an NBA team. I can't tell you which one. 
That's but fine. the guy who had the dots really close together, he got 30 out of 30 free throws. The guy who had the dots all over the place, and each each dot is where he was looking when he was making his free throws. He got 14 or 15 out of 30 free throws. Mm. And so what that showed us was that quiet eye idea that if you're looking at a specific point while you're while you're about to make the shot, when you make the shot and just after the shot, you have a higher chance of success. Because all those points were close, close to the same point, close to the same together. Each green dot being a place where he was looking. Now that's in basketball. So that we can train people in the quiet eye in basketball to have higher, you know, success, success with shots. Right. We take that same technology over to the batter, we put that glasses on him when he's batting and look to see what he's looking at in terms of the pitcher. And right. you want to you want to have your eyes out in ahead of the release point. So you want to look at the hand of the glove. You want to see how the hand is there because sometimes the pitcher will tip tip the pitch based on how he's holding the yes. ball. When the ball when the hand comes behind the back, that's when you want to move out to where the ball's going to be released. And you wait there. And you let his hand with the ball come through that point. Come through the zone. You're okay. The spot and you're picking up all the information. And that's what we do with the other picture you saw there. So that's technology that's pretty new, that's uh, pretty newly used, that's really given a lot of insight into how to perform better. Man, that's that's, that's yeah, that's 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 definitely cutting edge. And um, man, it's almost well, now nah, I was gonna say it's a field test. It's it's a field test on steroids, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. It it started this this whole technology started actually for supermarkets. Because uh, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but the shelves in supermarkets are kind of rented out to companies like Kellogg's yeah. or the Wonder, yeah. you know, whatever. and the companies pay more for shelves where people are going to look. So, for example, when you make a turn on the aisle, the first right, the shelf right near the turn, no one mm -hmm. looks at the shelf right in the corner there. They walk inside a little bit before they start looking at what's on the aisle. And so that's not a very expensive point. Right. But midway in the aisle, eye level, that's going to be worth a lot of money. Right. And so what they can do is use glasses like this and have people walk around stores and look to see what they're looking at and decide on, you know, this is a point that's going to people look at. So we're going to charge more for that. And here's a place no one, no one looks at. So, you know, it's going to be cheaper. Wow. That, that's, that's there is. Uh, I definitely learned that in grad school way, way, way back. Um, well, not exactly that, but kind of, a, um, you know, supermarkets are set up so that all of the bad stuff is in the middle aisles. And the good stuff is around the outside. But to that point, we're at in the middle aisle. So if it's at the middle aisles at maybe a five, six-year-old height, because those are the kids that want the mm -hmm. cocoa, you know, the joko, <laughs> yeah, whatever cereal. And they want to be there because the kids know that's the mother for the, the cocoa cereal, whatever it is. That, oh, wow. So yeah, That's uh, wow. I don't think people really realize how much we're manipulated, you know, yes. by uh, all sorts of stuff, you know, uh, advertising. People have gotten very savvy at how to advertise to people, how to get the people to to buy stuff, to do stuff, how to get the little kid to pick up the cereal and, and go, Mom, I want this, I want this, I want this, until she gives in, right? Um, it's it's not so, you know, you think about it, it's not so cool, but it's that's business, right? Yeah, definitely it's business. Uh, last question before we, we, we get out of here, Doc. What's on the horizon for sports vision? What, what's what's in the next 10, 10 years? Where do you see sports vision at going? Where it's going to be at? Well, one of, you know, one of the things is is using AI and using uh, advanced statistics to try to really finely tune differences in players and how we can predict their their performance in the future. So to evaluate somebody who's you know maybe in college and have a good idea of how they're going to play when they get to you know professional higher professional levels. And I think that's that's definitely refining and improving even now. And I think that's going to just get better as time goes forward. I think the use of uh, head-mounted display, like virtual reality type stuff, mm -hmm. as you see those, like the new Apple device, which is really sharp in terms of, of the resolution of the screens, as we see that improving, I think we're going to find more kind of simulations of sports and allow people to actually perform parts of the sport without actually being on the field, um, without getting the physical wear and tear, but be able to get the mental and the visual aspects of, of identification and timing down uh, i think we'll see as as those technologies increase and improve that we'll see more and more of that um so that, that's those are kind of the main areas i'm thinking about wow that's incredible yeah ai technology all this it's it's definitely incredible it's yeah it's, it's incredible incredible it's incredible it's kind of scary to me you know it's <laughs> dinosaurs all this technology kills me but well, I 
I got a grandson. I guess I'll be sending up to you guys. You know, to, uh, figure it all out. One. Seen he's, one? He's, yeah, yeah. Listen, he's playing baseball, so I don't care what his parents say. <laughs> okay, said it right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you, Doctor uh, Labby, for coming through, man. I appreciate this um this wonderful conversation about sports vision, and it's definitely, definitely very, very, very eye opening. No pun intended. That that I didn't plan that, but um, I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> but. No let me give you some applause on that. <laughs> but, but, uh, this was a very, very good conversation. I appreciate you again coming through, and um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot definitely with this um, this sports vision stuff. And Da is going to write his high school coach a letter. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, man. he gets it. Yeah, he couldn't hit the. Yeah, he couldn't I hit could the not. fastball. It's fine. It's fine. But listen. Yeah, look, it's, it's, Hey Dan, could you could you just uh, once more t- one more time just let me know the name of the book so the whole world knows? Yep. yep, the book is is called Eye of the Champion, and it's available on Amazon. If you just type in the Eye of the Champion or my name, uh, it will come up. Cool, thank you, sir. There you go, right there. It's on Amazon. Got it pulled up for y'all. So those that are watching, please, please, please support Dr. Labby. It's very great information. Um sort of the eye of a champion so that's 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 a very great title for um for you doctor thank you so much for coming through uh we're gonna get on out of here man hey make sure you like click and subscribe to the channel uh make sure on the podcast side you give us that five um five star review also yeah five star review uh support dr labby with his book eye of the champion man this is uh and we're gonna get on out of here thank you again doctor so much hey Thank you, Make sir. Me. Great meeting you. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy. Yes, this was, this was awesome, man. So we're going to get out of here. Make sure you guys have a good night. And I guess I'll play the music. And where's the music at? I'm sorry. I don't have a producer. Uh, where's the producer at? Uh, he's still taking care of his newborn. <laughs> <laughs> he should be coming back to work soon. The producer is my son. Yeah. And, oh, and the baby is my grandson. So There we go. That's going to be playing baseball. <laughs> I'm playing baseball. <laughs> Yo, this this is the Sports Chasers Podcast. Y'all be good. Be blessed, man. We'll see y'all later. Take care. Peace. Thank you. That's a wrap for today's episode of the Sports Chasers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms and connect with us on all social media channels for exclusive content and updates. We'd also love for you to join the conversation, share your thoughts, and become part of the Sports Chasers community. And remember to tune in next time for some more real sports talk. Until then, stay frosty.